Hi, I'm Rick. I lead the River Church in Newcastle. Thank you so much for joining us online during lockdown. Uh, after a little break last week, uh, we're going to pick up again uh, in our Acts series and we're going to follow straight after from where we left off a couple of weeks ago uh, after Acts 2. So we're now into Acts 3 and in Acts 2 uh, verse 42 it says the apostles were doing many signs and wonders. Well in, in chapter 3 Luke the author zooms in on one of these events and it's an incredible account uh, but he makes very clear to point out this is not the apostles doing anything but this is Jesus at work. This is Jesus resurrection. This is Jesus new creation. He's in charge and this is his work. Now, uh, if you are following our series, um, I want to tell you that this uh, preach is going to cover the period from Acts 3 verse 1 to Acts 4 verse 31, which is a massive chunk of uh, the Bible. So we don't have time to, to read all of that and go into it in depth. Um, so instead, my friend Charlotte, she's part of the River Church, in a minute she's just going to, to read the first 16 verses of chapter 3 and then I'll make some points afterwards uh, on, on all of it but I would encourage you if you do have a Bible uh, near you why not have it open because I will be making comments from chapters 3 and 4 and it'd be great to, to follow those as we go thanks so much I'll see you in just a moment over to you Charlotte reading from the ESV Acts 3 1 to 16 now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer the ninth hour and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognised him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or pity we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he asked you to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Thanks, Charlotte. And then Peter continues in his preach. But we won't uh, go into that too much because uh, Acts 2, uh, we've, we've already covered, and that's a huge uh, example of Peter's preaching. Uh, but something really unusual happens at the end, I want to point out. He and his friends get arrested by the religious authorities of the day. And you think, why? What, what for? Well... You might think, because you think back to Luke's gospel, that uh, uh, like Jesus, they rubbed him up the wrong way because he, they healed on the wrong day like Jesus did. No, this is nothing to do with the healing itself. Peter points out as much in the trial in chapter four. He says, uh, you know, you can't arrest someone for doing something nice, doing something good. No, they are arrested because of Jesus. This is all about him. It's about what Peter preaches. He says, you crucified Jesus and God has raised him from death. And just as God has raised Jesus from the dead, the same power has given this man the ability to walk, moved from sickness to health. The lame shall leap like deer, prophesied Isaiah, about the kingdom that was coming. 
about the new creation that Jesus would start. And we now stand in his new creation, in his resurrection life. Jesus is risen, is risen, so death is defeated. And Jesus is alive and well, and so sickness goes. There will come a day when everyone who believes in Jesus will be resurrected like him and will have a resurrection body like his. But that isn't right now because the kingdom is now and not yet. It is still to come, but it is today. And this healing is a foretaste, a physical outworking of the promise that one day God will wipe away every tear, will blot out every sickness and will ultimately defeat death. It is because of proclaiming the resurrection through word and deed and through preaching and healing that Peter is arrested. And it's on the same grounds then that he's let go. Because the, the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the leaders at the time, they couldn't prove that Jesus wasn't resurrected, that he was still in the tomb. So they had to let them go. Now we're going to look in more detail uh, in a, a few weeks at, at Acts 5, um, at one of the trials uh, that the apostles went under. But it's just encouraging to reflect that the religious leaders of the time, just as the historians of today, can't prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, except that people don't normally rise from the dead. But he is risen and he has initiated his new creation. And in his new creation, he is recreating those who were sick to be well. And so they let Peter go. And, uh, and he goes back to his friends. I love this. He's, um, they said, stop preaching Jesus. And he says, no, I won't. But then he runs to his friends and says, I'm scared. I don't want to preach Jesus anymore. And so they invite the Holy Spirit. Please give us boldness. And he comes. The room is shaken and they're emboldened. It's okay to say, I'm going to follow Jesus and then ask for his help. Because this is written. The whole book of Acts is written to encourage Christians to continue preaching and healing and that continues today because God heals today why would he have stopped seriously has the power of the spirit of Jesus diminished somehow in the last 2,000 years or was it really the apostles who did the healing <laughs> and now that they're gone healing stopped no of course not it's his new creation his power by which we're healed so it continues today. And if you're with us uh, on Zoom on Sunday, we're, we're going to be praying for the sick. But before we do that, I, I want to make a couple of comments about the passage. The first one is this. The apostles saw the man's need. They saw his need. Now, if you know me, uh, you'll know I'm a, a big fan of 1960s music and I uh, love the 1969 classic from the Rolling Stones, You Can't Always Get What You Want. And if you don't know it, uh, the chorus goes like that. You can't always get what you want. They repeat it until the last line where they say, sometimes you get what you need. And it's true, we, we, we can uh, confuse what we want and what we need. And that's what the Stones are getting at. But actually, this story goes beyond that. Because the disciples saw what the man need even when he couldn't. And indeed, none of us truly know what we need until we have an encounter with Jesus. See, this man, he'd, he'd been lame for 40 years. Um, think about that. That's incredible. I'm 35. How many people do I know? No wonder it was such a, an incredible story then when he walked for the first time. No wonder the church swelled to 5,000 members, chapter 4 tells us. But he's not walked all his life. And it's easy for us to miss as Westerners used to the welfare state. But the truth is, if you didn't walk, you didn't work. Which meant he had a need for the kindness of strangers to give him cash for food and shelter. Give me shelter, he'd have said. No, probably not. That's just another Rolling Stone song. I'll stop making those jokes now. But the apostles saw his need, not for, not for money, not for silver and gold, but for the ability to make money, to earn. You know that old proverb, give a man a fish, he'll feed himself for a day. Teach him to fish, he'll feed himself for a lifetime. Whoopee, this doesn't apply on this occasion. 
Because if you gave the man the skill to, uh, to fish, he still wouldn't have the body to be able to do it. But they saw his need even greater than he could have imagined. And socially as well. I don't think I have to tell you that beggars have never been the most popular party guests. So they looked beyond what he wanted and to what he needed. And you know they learned that from Jesus. Because Jesus too, in the Gospels, was presented with a paralysed man. And he looked beyond that man's desire to walk and into his need. And he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. I know you want to walk, but do you know what you really need? You need reconciliation with your Father in heaven. You need a new life. And the way you get that is through forgiveness. And I can give you that. I can give you joy eternal. I can give you hope for tomorrow because I can give you forgiveness and reconciliation. And then to prove that he can do both, Jesus raises the man to walking. And that's what's going on in this story. It is an echo of Jesus' own life. And by healing this man... Peter is proclaiming that Jesus can heal and he can save. Indeed, he uses the words interchangeably. He heals today. He heals right now. Healing's great. But you know what? Knowing God is better. You've got to ask yourself, you want to get healed? You don't always get what you want. But in Jesus, you will always get what you need, which is forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with the Father, love, joy, peace today and hope for tomorrow. But we should ask the question, if God heals today, why doesn't everyone get healed? That's a tough question. Peter says this man is healed by faith in the name of Jesus. Faith in the name of Jesus. Now maybe you've been around church a little bit, you've read your Bible, and this, this thing about praying in the name of Jesus comes up now and again. It can sometimes feel a bit like a, a magic word, can't it? Alakazam, you're healed. In the name of Jesus, you're healed. It doesn't work like that at all. Indeed, the, the disciples, when they're called to the trial, the, the religious leaders say to them, by what power or by what name did you do this thing? They didn't ask what magic word did you use. Someone else is going to ask that later. By what name did you do it? They mean by what authority? The Acts of the Apostles is about the Apostles acting under the authority of Jesus. Peter's even preached it. Jesus is the author of life. Author is the beginning part of authority. That means the one who writes life gets to decide what happens. This is his new creation. He calls the shots. He decides who gets healed and who doesn't. And do you know what? He doesn't do it just willy-nilly. He does it in all wisdom, all insight, the Bible tells us. Everything he does is good. He will give you what you need. And that might be healing. But it might not. And so when we pray in the name of Jesus, we say we come in the authority of Jesus. We come in submission to Jesus. We trust him to do what is good because he is good and he always will be. And he is. He is the one who sees your need even more than you do. So why do some people get healed and some people don't? Why do some people instantly get healed and some it takes time? Like even Jesus experienced when he gave the blind man his sight and it happened in stages. I don't know. It's a mystery. And yes, faith is involved. But we don't know whose faith. We don't know if it was Peter's faith or the man's faith. We know the man looked at Peter in expectation. Was that faith? We know that Peter looked at the man in compassion. Was that faith? We don't know. It's a mystery. It's an inexact science. No one has a, a faith meter by their ear that says, oh, you've got four out of seven faith today. You're not going to get healed. Nonsense. Don't let anyone tell you you haven't been healed because you didn't have enough faith. 
How could they possibly know that? I'm so sorry if that's been your experience. But faith is involved. And it's a mystery. But I tell you this. The Bible says that healing is a gift from our Father in heaven. And it says faith is the same. And when you have forgiveness, when you have reconciliation with the Father, you can come and ask for more of both. You say, heal today. Give me faith for healing today. And he will come. And I want to finish with a testimony from my own family that he heals today. I'm going to invite uh, my wife Cheryl to come and share some of our story. That he heals today. This is his new creation and he is bringing life out of death and wellness out of sickness. Thanks Rick. So four or five years ago, before our children were born, I had a severe headache come on at work. It got worse over a weekend and we ended up in A&E and were told that I had had a brain bleed and they also found a brain tumour. Um, it was a total shock to us. We had no idea. I had had no other symptoms. At this point in time, we had been trying to have a baby for about nine months and because of where the tumour was in my brain, it became quickly apparent that it was unlikely that would that would ever happen for us. We spoke to a consultant who was very senior very quickly who said um, that people that were the, with the kind of brain bleed I had, nearly everybody um, is immediately infertile or everyone is immediately infertile. And then a majority of people that have these bleeds need temporary hormones because you stop producing the hormones you need for your body um, and a small percentage of those have lifelong hormone replacement therapy. So we left that meeting really devastated. Um, they also told us that if we did um, become, if I did become pregnant, that I could potentially go blind. Um, yeah, so it was a really tough time for us as a family. We were really devastated. We had really wanted to have children and it was, having that taken away from you was really painful. Um, we went away to, to rest on holiday and um, discovered after four days that um, I was actually pregnant. We phoned the consultant immediately and went, um, were asked to go to hospital as an emergency due to the state of what was happening. Um, we didn't because we were away. <laughs> we went in the next week. Um, what we hadn't understood was that they believed I had a hormonal pregnancy, which is when sometimes when you experience severe or significant trauma, your body can become convinced it's pregnant and produce all of the hormones for pregnancy so you can have a positive test, but actually there can not be a child. And that's what our doctor had presumed had happened, although he didn't tell us that. So we had a scan and saw the baby um, and then all hell broke loose <laughs> in the unit. We went and sat and waited for um, to see a doctor to talk about the baby we didn't realize the significance of what was happening at all and at the time i worked in the brain department at um, work and saw a number of my colleagues appearing um, and wondered who they were coming to see um, it transpired it was me um, the consultant came into the room and said to us so you're the miracle everyone's talking about we had no idea what he meant and it was only then that we were explained about all the hormones and everything that um, meant that i shouldn't be able to have a child. He explained that he'd called multiple specialists in multiple other areas. They'd researched online to see if this had ever happened before. And as far as they're aware, this had never, there was never a documented case of someone conceiving immediately after this kind of brain bleed. Um, so then we had a very stressful year. <laughs> um, so it was totally miraculous that I became pregnant with our daughter. It was incredible. And um, we have less to say that it's miraculous. Um, but then what followed was actually a really, really hard year a year of real pain. We waited to see if my hormones would collapse, which would put the baby's life at risk and my own, we, which didn't happen, which again was incredibly miraculous, is very, very, very rare. Um, we then waited to see if I might go blind um, and that didn't happen. 
which was fantastic because no one had ever experienced this. They didn't know what would happen. So even going into labor, um, Rick had my mobile phone from work and had neurosurgeons phone numbers on it and knew to call immediately if something went wrong because they didn't know if I could have another brain hemorrhage in labor. Um, so it was a really strange year for us. And I liken it so much to the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They um, are thrown into a huge fire, a big pit of fire for following God, for declaring that they believe in him. And before they go into the fire, they just say something along the lines of, we believe that our God will save us from this fire. But even if he does not, we know that he is still good. And that was our testimony of that year, that every step of the way we saw God's provision and we knew that if I went blind, we knew that if all things happened, we could look back and see that God had been good. And he provided again and again and again and again. And um, I went through labour fine. We, my, our daughter was born, who is having her fourth birthday this weekend. Um, today, in fact, her birthday is today. Um, her fourth birthday is today. Um, it was amazing and we thought how incredible God has provided this child who we were told would never be um, and a few months after she was born um, I had another brain scan to see what was happening with the brain tumour and at this point we just thought you know what God has got us through to here whatever happens next we can look back and know that he's good that he is faithful always so we went to this appointment to find out and our consultant pulled my brain scan up on his computer and laughed and laughed and said, your brain tumour's gone. Of course it's gone. Of course it's gone. Um, and he was astounded. He didn't know how it happened. There's a very small percentage of people with this kind of brain tumour that can disappear after a bleed, but it's highly unlikely. Um, and for us, that was the end of the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, is that Jesus meets them in the fire. They walk out the other side of a fire unharmed, and it says there was not even a smell of smoke on them. And we came out of that year without even a smell of smoke on that, with no brain tumour, with a healthy child, with me being totally healthy, and God showing us again and again that he is the God who can heal and can do miracles. So if there is an area of pain where you want God to bring healing in your life, ask him, come before him again and again. Sometimes it looks like a blind man walking. Sometimes it looks like a paralyzed man standing up immediately. Sometimes it looks like ongoing complexity and pain and God coming and showing you how faithful he is again and again. Sometimes we don't see healings, but we know through it all that God is good, that he loves you, that he is for you. And whatever happens, he has sent his son to die for you because of the depth of his love. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Bye.